Well, hey everyone, and welcome back. What we have here is a very simple relative dating problem where we have several layers overlying each other. We've got some that are folded down on the bottom. Uh, we've got some, looks like an igneous intrusion coming through here. Um, we've got a lot going on, um, to say the least. It is a relatively small scale one, um, but I think this does illustrate a lot of the concepts that you'll be using in larger scale uh, problems where you're looking at relative dating between rocks like this. So over here on the side, this is what we're going to use to order the uh, deposition of each layer and take note that we will use x to represent when relatively the fault occurs, that's this fault line here, and y to represent relatively when the fold occurs. And of course I use the term relatively to say uh, with respect to the deposition of the actual layers of rock we're looking at here. Okay, so let's begin. Now, when looking for the oldest, it's almost always a good idea just to go straight to the bottom. So we'll go from oldest to youngest, um, down at the bottom here. So, when looking for the oldest, it's easiest to just look straight for the bottom, because if you recall, the law of superposition states that sedimentary strata will always go on top of one another. Um, they'll always be deposited uh, with the oldest being on the bottom and the youngest being on the top, assuming they haven't been overturned by some sort of fold. So, because of that, we can say that, well, since A is on the bottom, there's this layer down here that I didn't bother labeling, um, but out of the ones that we care about, A is on the bottom, therefore A must have come first. We know that it came before all of the other layers because it's at the bottom of all of them, and we know that it must have come before the folding or the faulting because you can't fold or fault rock that doesn't exist. Simple enough, right? And then after having established that, we pretty much just go and look to the one above it and say, well, was there anything that occurred between these two that um, would have resulted in something coming between them? So if we look up at B, well, did a fold occur between A and B? No, because both of them are folded in the exact same fashion. Did the fault occur to A and not B? Well, no, because we can see it cuts through both of them and it affects both of them equally here, looking at this displacement that the layers receive. So therefore, we can safely say that B comes directly after A. Granted, maybe with a little bit of erosion or something in between, but for the sake of this example, we don't need to care about that necessarily. Then we can move on upwards and we ask the same question about layer D. Did the folding or faulting occur to only these two layers and not D, meaning that one of them would have occurred between them? Well, no. As we can see, once again, the, f the uh, fault appears... It's a little hard to see on this picture, I guess, but what I intended was... Um, that it, it's still affecting D. You can see right here, it, it does indeed cut through a little bit, and then it pops up a little bit up here through E. So D comes both after the folding and the folding. It is both under the fault line, and it is folded. And then we can finally ask the same question about E. Well, as we can tell, E is in fact still folded, and once again, hard to see, but that fault line does peek up behind layer C. So, once again, E is both folded and faulted, so it must have occurred, the deposition of E must have occurred directly after the deposition of D. Okay, so those are the first four, and that was all pretty simple. Uh, we just went up and basically checked, is there anything that might have occurred between the deposition of these layers? And the answer, again and again, was no which allows for, for us to simply go boom, 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 boom in ordering these. Easy enough. However, when we get up to the next layer, F, we see there's something dramatically different. There's actually an angular unconformity formed here between F and E and F and D. So we know that something had to have happened here. And the first thing we can ask ourselves is, well, what about the folding? Well, in fact, since F is flat, and these are all folded, they're curved, they're all set at interesting angles. We have a, an antiform in here and a sinform in here. Then F must have occurred after the folding. 
But then the other question is, well, what about the faulting? And ah, you see if the fault ends right here, then f must have also, excuse me, occurred after the fault. So f occurs after both x and y. So we know that those two must be the next, uh, the next events that we're going to be listing here. But the question is, which came first, the fault or the fold? Well, if we just look at this, we can see that since all of these seem to follow a very uniform fold, you can see that they, they follow this kind of nice, neat sort of wave structure like that. We can safely say that the folding must have occurred before, because if there was a fault that broke before, then we would have a much, then the, the folds would look much different on each side. Whereas they seem to be following a very similar pattern, it's just they've been interrupted, right? It's like if we just threw a slash through there. It's the same pattern, it's just the lower half has been displaced, so it looks something more like that. Meanwhile, if it were a fault, then a fold, if it were like, you know, something like where we just have a flat layer, then a fa fault cuts through, then we'd have something like that. If these started to fold, they would fold unevenly, so we would have something like that folds like that, and then that folds completely differently, something, you know, it wouldn't look as nice and uniform. So we can safely say that the folding then occurs before the faulting, and that makes sense too, uh, just thinking about what these two things entail, because folding is generally smaller amounts of pressure, so that likely occurred in the build-up to the massive release of pressure that was the fault. Okay, so we got those out of the way. Now we can move on up to F. And now at this point we can say, well, F is still directly beneath C, so F must have been directly after the faulting and the folding. That's where we get our unconformity there. Then we can move up once more to G, and G appears to be under the exact same circumstances as F. Um, no faulting or folding has occurred between the two. They're both laying flat. And G is still below C, so G, therefore, must have come directly after F. And finally, we come to our igneous intrusion, C. And since, by the law of cross-cutting relationships, because it cuts through everything that we see in this picture, it must be the youngest. So C comes at the very end. So we have A, B, D, E, Y, X, F, G, C, in that order, from oldest to youngest. That was a relatively simple example. Hopefully it was helpful. Um, if you'd like to see more of these sort of walking through type of videos where we do more um, problem-based uh, geology rather than theoretic stuff, um, just let me know. Anyways, hopefully it was informative. Otherwise, good review. Hope you guys enjoyed, and I will see you all in the next video. Ciao. And layer C. Well, the law of superposition simply states that since C relative to A is above it in this cross-sectional view, C must be younger than A.